Okay, so I'm just conscious of time, so we will make a start. So I'd like to um, introduce you to myself. My name is Jo Thompson and I work for HR Recruit. And today's virtual boardroom is about how Agile can revolutionise HR in 2022, which is being facilitated by Kate Madison Greenwell. So without further ado, I shall hand you over to Kate and hopefully you'll uh, really enjoy the session. Lovely. Um, thank you very much, Jo. I really appreciate it. And I'm so happy to be here today. Um, so we'll we'll crack on, I think, without much um, further ado. Uh, do let me know if uh, if anything stops working with regards to the screen. You know how uh, how these things can sometimes happen. So a little bit um, about myself and, and how I how I fell into um, into agile. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but for for quite a while, for many years while I was working in in HR, I always had this kind of internal scream that there must be a better way. And I was finding that more and more responsibilities were, were coming to HR under the tag of of people. But of course, everything's people. Um, HR was becoming more and more transactional, um, admin, following process, processing data, reporting, all of those things. And it was usually for groups of people at a time. So whenever there was a problem, HR was needed to fix it. And I noticed that the majority of companies had a, a parent-child kind of approach where the senior leadership team would make the difficult decisions, the mid middle management would then execute that, and then everybody else will follow orders um, through their long list of duties on, on their job descriptions. And, and really not enough attention was being paid to the way in which we work, so the framework within which we're communicating, collaborating and improving. So certainly for, for, for myself and, and for the businesses that I was working in, um, we were just doing the same thing over and over, kind of fighting fires and getting through the day. And then a few years ago, I overheard my then boyfriend, now current husband, um, playing uh, planning poker. Um, and this was virtually and we were both working from home before it uh, before it became sexy. Um, and he was playing planning poker and he was explaining um, that it was part of a process where the team were making decisions together on what they wanted to focus on um, and that they were self-organizing. And that got me hooked onto um, Agile and I could see the benefits for, for HR to evolve. So I started using these methods with my own teams and then eventually I started my own business uh, running courses and offering coaching um, and consultancy services for HR departments and leadership teams to change their culture and, and to undergo business transformation. So what we're going to be doing today is um, hopefully familiarising you with the concept of Agile, giving you an overview as to how Agile fits, um, talking to you a little bit about benefits to HR through using Agile methods, and then I've got a couple of offers um, to start you on your Agile journey at the end. So let's talk a little bit about um, the HR revolution or evolution, depending on, um, depending on your, your viewpoint. So I've got a little challenge for you. So I've put some terms that I often hear um, being HR being referred to as or, or about. So I'd like you to have a look at these. And then on the next slide, I've got a QR code. So if you've got your phone with you, um, you can have a look. Um, you can hold it up to the QR code and then tell me which one of these terms jumps out at you or resonates with you or you most hear HR being referred to. So there's probably one or two on there. So I'll let you have a look. It's not a memory game, um, but I'd just be interested to know what, um, what you think HR is often referred to as. So I'll go on to the next slide. So hopefully you can see the QR code. And tell me which one of those terms you think HR is referred to the most or about. So I've delivered this a few times, this, this webinar. And um, there's always one in particular that comes up first. There we go. Yes, you did not let me down. <laughs> HR police is always the first one. Um, but yeah, absolutely. No seat at the table, hired and fired. Absolutely. Uh, hired and fired. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No phone, but would say HR police and hired and fired. Yeah, brilliant. Doesn't set strategy. Yeah, it's it's usually those ones. So at least at least we're not alone. At least we're all all in this in the same uh, in the same boat. So really, with with HR, 
we're, we're looking at evolving into something that can be um, strategic and supportive of businesses as they as they um, move on and navigate um, in terms of their business plan. So really, we need to be focusing on HR becoming one of these things that's on the screen. Um, so becoming coaches and mentors and thought leaders empowering and engaging and creating experiences with employees, becoming a profit enabling center rather than a cost center, um, unlocking human potential. And there's lots of things there. And one of the things that Agile does is that it means it gives a framework where you can design um, changes or, or different products for HR uh, quickly using fast design, implementation and iteration. And I'm gonna be talking to you about that today. So let's ask the question, why does HR itself need to be agile? Well, we're currently operating in a VUCA world and you may have heard that term before. It's volatile, uncertain, complex or chaotic and ambiguous. And it means that requirements are changing constantly for businesses. So there's skill shortages, COVID, Brexit, inflation, there's currently a cost of living crisis in the UK. And this drives employee behavior to change. So whereas once they might have tolerated things like, I don't know, late payment of expenses or something, they, they won't now. And where they may have tolerated undervaluing themselves, they're not doing that now. So employees are viewing where they work as an extension of their life and not their sole purpose with everything else slotting in. So companies are also facing challenges. So where once they would have raised wages, perhaps to entice competitor talent, they're having to make their working environment a lot more attractive to retain. And that's often harder than, than raising wages. So they're often experiencing issues like low productivity, uh, low retention or high attrition, any one of these things that's on there. Um, ones that I've experienced are um, operating in silos. That's often been a, a real challenge. Um, and also blockers or obstacles or impediments not being identified in time. And there's a lot of frustration because change isn't happening very quickly or um, impending change is, is being delayed. So if we ask ourselves why our businesses need its HR to be agile, well, there's a few statistics on this. And the ones that I like to pull out are the fact that um, in, in a survey by Deloitte, 94% of survey companies reported that agility and collaboration are going to be critical to their organization's success. And 60% of survey companies reported that they'd experienced a growth in profits after adopting an agile approach. And that was just last year. So if we ask the question, and, and this was me when I was watching my, my husband uh, playing this, this game on, on, the, uh, on the computer screen. What even is agile? I mean, I'd heard about agility. I'd, you know, I'd, I'd kind of heard something to do with IT maybe. But what even is agile? Well, agile itself with, with a capital A is, is a mindset. And it's about establishing a shared vision and moving towards those goals in an iterative manner the advantage of the company and the employees. So it's about valuing teams over individuals and then hiring and retaining people with specialist skills to do what needs to be done to move forwards instead of job descriptions with long lists of duties that perhaps don't add value to the end goal. And it's about working together across functions instead of being siloed and making decisions separately that hold progress back. It's about empowering employees to fail fast and safely whilst minimizing risk to truly find solutions that improves the employee's experience, which will then in turn improve the customer experience and drive that competitive advantage regardless of industry. And there's lots of ways in which Adal does this. So I've put some up there. So it's about being employee focused, self-organizing teams, having a shared vision and, and removing as much bureaucracy as possible and, and, and as much top-down hierarchy. So some of the terms that you might hear associated with Agile are things like shared vision, being able to respond to change without derailing plans, teams over individuals, human-centric, people-centric. You might have also heard of some terms like um, some frameworks like Scrum or Kanban. I'm going to be talking to you about that um, in a bit. So as part of the Agile mindset, there's an Agile manifesto. 
Um, and what that means is that there's a methodology behind that mindset. So what you can see here is, is a top line. And with um, agile practitioners, they value the top line over the bottom line. So it's important to say they value it over, not instead of. So what that means is that as agile practitioners, we value things like individuals and iterations over processes and tools. So we focus on how employees are working together and the value it adds over long-winded processes, perhaps because somebody did something wrong one time. And it deems that a quick connection with someone gets you further. So we value working processes over comprehensive documentation, which means that we're about delivering improvements early and often rather than providing long-winded documentation that perhaps won't be read. We value employee collaboration over contract negotiation, which means that we value working with employees with what they need or what's blocking them in their role over relying on perhaps what's in their contract. And also responding to change. We value that over um, following a plan. So we like to work out what's needed to make working life better rather than taking a big bang approach that takes a long time to roll out. So there's some principles around this, and I'm not going to go through all of these. There's 12 principles of Agile, but the ones that I focus on um, in my Agile in HR courses are the ones that I've highlighted. So they're about creating um, self-organizing teams of motivated individuals that work together daily and succeed together. So we also focus on things like how to get the most value out of the least amount of work, which sounds like a utopia and is definitely my favorite principle. Um, and it, it sounds like it, it possibly can't be done, but it, it can if you have a shared purpose and having specialist skills and regular reflections and improvements to behaviors. And one of the things I've talked about is, is specialist skills. So when an agile team is put together to focus on, on a project or to focus on, um, on a change, um, often that team is something called T-shaped. And what that means is, is having the right specialisms within teams. So that means that everybody on the team has a broad understanding um, of, of things like subject matter, um, or if it was a HR team, they would have a broad understanding of HR, a broad understanding of strategy, perhaps, broad understanding of employment law. But then there would be people within the team that have specialist or deep skills. And depending on the nature of the project, that could be something like talent attraction or analytics or um, employee relations or organizational development. So the point is that people have a broad understanding of the subject matter and then they have specialist skills. So I've got a question to ask you. Have you ever been part of a project that didn't get buy-in or didn't succeed? And the challenge is to tell us why in three words or less. So I've got another QR code for you. Um, if you want to put, put that up or if you want to put it in the chat, that either way is absolutely fine. So have you ever been part of a project that didn't get buy-in or didn't succeed? So tell us why in three words or less. Sometimes people are a little bit smug and they do, oh, there we go, they do it in just one word and it's usually, it's usually communication. So yeah, poor initial communication, absolutely. Stakeholders, somebody's just put in the chat, brilliant. Communication, goalposts moved, absolutely not consulted, hierarchical, if I can say it, time delays. Lack of, I'm gonna, yeah, lack of vision, I think there. So yeah, absolutely. So so you've all been part of projects that that haven't um, that haven't succeeded or or they didn't get buy in. Um, lack of resources, yeah, that's another good one. So quite often that's because um, something called the waterfall method is used, and there is a place for the waterfall method. But if you want to make quick changes, then the waterfall method um, isn't often the go to solution. And what the waterfall method looks like is this. You establish a project, you then plan, you then create or invite solutions. So whether that's a platform or a system, you know, you might invite people into tender or what have you. Then time passes while you get all of those people together or, or, you, or you, you, know, you, you look into the solutions or you create the solutions. If, if you're in HR, we often have to do that. Then you launch. 
then you might train you, know, you might train people on that um, and obviously time passes while you train people but the critical thing is is that you then have to wait to see if it's been successful and the way that you determine whether it's been successful is by either getting feedback from people or by seeing whether people use that solution or not so often there's a lot of money invested a lot of time invested um, and it kind of falls down the last hurdle because of how long it's taken for something to be achieved. And of course, when a lot of time passes, the problem that might have been yesterday's problem might not be the main issue or the main problem by the time you've, you've resolved it. And that's something to perhaps bear in mind. So to give you a bit of a visual, a visual on that, the waterfall method. So all of the difficult decisions are made at the beginning and then you follow that plan and you, you keep on that plan and you head to that goal. But the risk of it not working or not being suitable or not being appropriate um, or not resolving the problem um, becomes greater as you go along. And of course, as HR people, we're quite risk averse. You know, we like to be perfect, um, but often perfection can hamper progress and it can often create silos, too, because it's a HR problem and HR are going to fix it. Um, so that's that's something that I've, I've witnessed and, and I've seen. So what if I give you a bit of a, a graphic on that? Um, if you think about it in terms of building a car, if you if you have a problem that needs to be solved or a change that needs to be solved where you need to get your employees from A to B, the way that you might do it is you might start off with a wheel, then you might put two wheels together, then you might build the body, and then you might put the body, the chassis, or what have you, um, and the wheels all together. Um, and what happens there is that employees or, or humans or whoever it is, are not able to use that solution until right at the very end when, when you've put it all together. And you have to think about how long that will take, how your employees will feel about that in the meantime, um, and will they have frustrations about um, their problem not being solved until the end. With Agile, we think about it differently. So what we think about is putting the employees at the center so that we can start solving problems and we start making improvements and testing solutions as we go so that we're constantly chipping away at changes and improvements. So if there was an issue of getting from A to B, we might start off with a skateboard. So not everybody can use it. It's going to be difficult. You're not going to be able to get as far as you perhaps want to, but it's a start and it's of use. After feedback and after um, you know, gathering some, some more ideas, we might then add on handlebars so that we can go a little bit further, um, but we're still not quite getting from A to B, but we can go a little bit further. After some more feedback, we might then transform it into a bike or into a, a bike, even a bike with an engine. It's still a bit rubbish when it rains, but it's getting people further to where they need to be. And then right at the very end, we're able to put that together into a car and we, we can be confident that people are going to use it. It's solving the right problem um, and you know, the majority of people are going to be able to use it. So hopefully that gives you um, a, a bit of an idea as to, as to where I'm coming from with this, with this uh, graphic. So if we then think about that in terms of like employee engagement and employee experience, well, things are moving on. So this is something that we've got from Gartner um, in terms of, of how we, we measure employee engagement. So we're kind of stuck for a lot of companies. We're kind of stuck in this um, 2010s part where we're enabling and we're supporting people to do their best work. Um, and you can see how it's how it's transitioned to, to this part. And it's obviously very important to enable and to support people. But really, we should be moving to focusing on the employee voice. We should be looking at how well our employees' voice is heard and how well we are improving their experience. So if we think about that waterfall method and we put this into a real life case study, um, I'll show you the difference between, um, between the two methodologies. So if we can imagine that some employee survey results have come in and they detail that 30% of employees are happy, 50% are a bit ambiguous, they're neither happy or unhappy, and 20% are unhappy. So hopefully if you do a survey, your, your results will be slightly more specific than this. But let's just go with this for the purpose of clarity. 
So what often happens, the CEO will pass it to HR um, because obviously HR needs to fix this. Um, and HR, the HR team may then research ways to make employees feel more engaged. And we might do this by, um, you know, by looking at things like reward companies um, that have been sending us stuff and, and you know, have got various um, initiatives. Um, we might find that employees could do with a pay rise. And of course, mental health services um, is, is always a burning issue in, in particular right now. Um, so this could be an opportunity to get some more support for that. But it takes time to, um, you know, to investigate things like this. You know, will we have to get mental health first aid volunteers? Do we need a better EAP, private health care? You know, all of these things. It's, it's, a, it's a big mountain to climb. So when you're looking at things like this, um, it may take a long time, a long time to gather um, all of that information, a long time to analyse perhaps the return on investment, a long time to get approval from the CEO. Um, you know, pay rises aren't going to be in this year's budget. They might be in next year's. It might be that the CEO doesn't really get the reward platform, so it keeps getting dropped to the bottom of the agenda. Um, it might be that you know mental health services you might get the go ahead for that, but you've then got to implement it and perhaps get volunteers, get them trained. All of those kind of things mean that there's a long period of time between establishing the issue and then actually making a difference to employees. And in the meantime, the employees are getting impatient. They've done the survey, they've highlighted why aren't things changing. The CEO is reluctant. They don't really know, um, they don't really have confidence that it's going to bring the improvements that's needed. And of course, as HR practitioners, we're really conscious of the time passing and the continued employee dissatisfaction. So with Agile, we look at it from a human-centered approach. And I've probably said, said that term quite a few times and I'll continue to say it. And um, But what that means when I talk about having a human or a people-centered approach, that means that we, we make the plan, we test it, we, we check it, um, we then reflect and then we put it into place um, and we then go back to it um, to improve further. We may continue to go back to it all of the time, um, but that's the cycle. We do something, we check it, we implement it and then we improve it. And when you do it that way, what that means is that you're then your risk is, is reduced because you're constantly doing a little thing, checking, then doing another little thing, checking. And because you're checking with um, the employees, you're making sure that the next iteration or the next improvement you make is going to be suitable and relevant. And if we think about that employee engagement measurement, that really fits in well with the objective of making sure that employees' voice is heard and their experience is improved. And that really helps with retaining the right skills and attracting the right talent and then keeping them engaged. So if we go back to that case study that I was telling you about, if we were to apply an agile solution to this, we would still start with the same, the same issue. But what could happen is that HR could lead the way with a problem statement activity. So actually getting to the root of the dissatisfaction or the ambiguity. So they would do that by assembling a self-organizing team that may consist of people, not just within HR. So they might bring in people from finance or our colleagues from operations or IT. And then once they've done that, we would then run a sprint to discover reasons for dissatisfaction. So we would look at doing a bit of user research, speaking to employees, um, doing some focus groups, some interviews. We might also look at some anecdotal um, issues by asking line managers, what keeps cropping up? What are people complaining about in one-to-ones? Has there been you know, grievances raised? Is, is there a trend there? And when we did this um, for, for a real company, um, we, we found um, what's on the screen now. So we discovered that, um, some of the regular issues that were impacting employees' working lives and well-being. Now, if you look at these, you might um, it might be tempting to think about a solution, an overall solution um, that could address some of these, something like a, a HR information system. So you might look at that and go, right, we need one of those or we need to improve the one that we've got. And that could be relevant, that could be a solution, um, and that could be a longer-term objective, but it's going to take a while to set that up. Um, in terms of getting budget approval and, and what have you, um, and sourcing the right one. And of course, as time goes on, 
other improvements could be discovered and, and we'd want to explore that. So we would look at something like this and we would say, okay, so let's, let's prioritise what we can do to make an impact with our employees right now. So we would run that prioritisation activity. And when we, do, when we did this, um we um we, we i'll show you the order in which we did it so it would be quite tempting to, to perhaps look at this and prioritize the pay issues that's often what what people would would go to and it's understandable because it's an it's an emotive subject um, but when we actually discussed it we realized that the pay issues were often caused by line managers running out of time and focus so just fixing the pay issues as a sole issue might not be a good use of time. And it's the same with leaders being overburdened. So whilst that's important, the value wasn't as high as perhaps um, some other quick fixes that could actually have an impact on the leaders feeling overburdened. So when we ran our prioritization activity, this was the order that we put it in. So we actually valued the quick fix of removing um, the holiday approvals frustration. So it was something that was really common. It was happening all the time. It was causing incredible negativity across the company. Um, and it was something that we felt that we, we could fix. So we didn't have any recruitment needs coming up. So while onboarding is of a really high value, we would want to fix some of the other issues first so that the onboarding wasn't then devalued with things like pay issues, holiday problems, and, and poor or non-existent appraisal processes. So once we'd done that prioritization, um, we then looked at some solutions and we came up with three solutions that we could test with small groups of employees. Um, and we were using Microsoft 365. It's quite a common tool. Um, and we also had somebody within the, the team that was that was from IT. So we came up with three solutions. Um, one of them was automating a workflow for approvals with, with the audit trail. Another one was having a group calendar with holidays on so that employees could at least reserve the dates pending approval. And then the third one was reducing the holiday approval sign us from two to one. So we tested these. And we very quickly discovered that having a group calendar with holidays on so that employees can reserve dates just didn't work. People were reserving dates left, right and centre. It was it was a bit chaotic. But the other two worked really quickly um, and, and worked well. So what that means is that within four weeks, bearing in mind um, we did two sprints, the first one was the discovery of exactly why people weren't very happy. Within four weeks, we'd understood what the problems were, we'd prioritised them and we'd come up with our first solution. And what that meant is that the employees could see some quick changes, which meant that they were reassured that they had been listened to. We started to raise some credibility within HR, which in turn started to raise things like the EVP. We started to gather evidence to be able to demonstrate to the CEO for future investments to show this is what the employees wanted, this is what we did, and this is the impact it had. We'd like to go again. And we also reduced some of the admin burden on the leaders. And that was, of course, one of the next priorities. We were also able to find some qualitative data for the future. So even though we, we tried something that didn't work, that's something that we can take with us as knowledge for the next time we want to test something. And of course, all of this is, is all evidence of the impact that the HR team has on the business. It's visual, it's transparent, um, and it's obvious to employees. And on top of that, the solutions we came up with were low cost solutions, and they were also, my favourite, low effort solutions. So that should give you a bit of a flavour as to the kind of impact Agile can have. And when you introduce things like Agile, the, the mindset starts to shift. So you start to move away from silos to collaboration and from kind of fixed solutions to actually embracing failure as part of an ongoing um, daily activity. You try something in a small way, if it works, brilliant. If it doesn't, you can take that knowledge and apply it to the next solution. But also it means that we're having an impact every day rather than every, every month or every year. And the benefits of that is that you can start to measure output. You're also getting continuous feedback from employees, which means you can better adapt. And you can also have better team collaboration because you're working cross-functionally. This means that you're constantly um, 
having a human centered view and you are always putting um, employees at, at the heart of, of what you're doing. And that comes across when it comes to making changes with, with culture. So to give you um, a bit of, of an idea as to how it works, um, when you have an agile team, um, what you do is you, you, you get the input in terms of problems or challenges or things that need to, um, that need to be implemented as part of the business strategy. And you have all of those, all of that information that comes in and you, and you use that as a backlog. So you have all of these activities, and we call them products. So they could be activities or tasks or, or problems that need to be solved. Each sprint, which is usually about two weeks, you pull um, particular uh, products um, to yourselves as a team and you make a commitment um, that you're going to, um, you're going to resolve each of, each of those products. Then you do your sprint and each day you have a daily stand up, which doesn't take any more than 10 minutes, where you just confirm that you're progressing or you highlight um, obstacles. Uh, and at the end of every two weeks, you have um, a sprint review to establish the impact and the difference that, that the um, sprint activities have made. But you also do a retrospective, which I really enjoy, which is about the behavior of the team um, and what you can do um, to, to be better next time, which could be training. It could be, you know, helping with, with certain behaviors. Um, but what's really good about the retrospective is that it's really transparent and people can actually see the impact that they're having positively, um, as well as areas for development. So that's something um, that, um, that, that should give you a bit of an idea as to the kind of framework. So that's, that's, you, that's the Scrum um, framework. So if you've ever heard of the term Scrum, that's what that looks like. So in terms of the benefits to, to Agile, there's lots and lots of benefits. Um, the ones that I particularly like are the breaking down of silos. So you really, you're just, you're a team of specialists um, that are working together um, to make an impact to the business strategy. Um, communication is more effective, transparency to process and change. People can be a little bit change weary, but usually that's because they don't really understand why things are changing. They don't understand the problems of staying the same can cause. Um, so there's some real transparency. And then you can also get continuous feedback. So if you're getting that from employees all the time, they feel a lot more involved and they feel that they're, they're taking part. So we're nearing the end, so I can take a breath. Um, so something um, that I do is, is I do an Agile in HR course where I talk about um, the structure of an Agile team and Agile roles and, and how um, you can implement that both within HR teams and externally to HR. Um, so we've got an offer at the moment, which is for £999 um, to take a team of, of up, to, um, up to 10 people through, through this course. Um, and also, if you book by the 26th of May, then I offer a free one hour coaching session for for the booker um, as well. I also have another offer um, as well, um, which is that um, I partner with Companion Approach, uh, which is a mental health um, app for the modern worker. It's a stress and anxiety app with support for HR. So if that's something that you'd be interested in, then I've organized for you guys to have a two week trial, free trial. And if you want to have a look at that um, and, and see if that's something that's really useful to you guys, but also useful to your company. Um, and there's also a code there, which I think Joe's going to send out in a bit to get 20% off as well. Um, and then the last bit is just for me, which is I would love to, um, to be part of your networks and for you to be um, part of my network on LinkedIn. So if you've got your phone on you, then um, please do um, connect with me by using the QR code on the left of the screen. Um, if not, Kate Madison Greenwell, you can look me up. That's, that's absolutely fine. And if you would be ever so gracious and lovely, I would love to get some feedback from you um, as well into this, this webinar in, in true agile way. If there's any improvements I can make, feel free um, to hit me with your feedback. That would be absolutely amazing. If you do, I do a monthly draw um, each month, weirdly, um, to, uh, to offer a free one hour coaching session. So just a little bit of an incentive for you to, to give me some feedback. And um, that will be fantastic. 
And that was the end. So hopefully that's given you a bit of an idea as to how we do it. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, but yeah, I'll hand back over to Joe, who can um, who's hopefully been keeping an eye on, on questions and what have you that's been coming in. So over to you, Joe. Thanks, Kate. I mean, to be honest, there hasn't really been um any questions, just more comments really, um, about how people have enjoyed it. But if anyone has got any questions and you want to put them in the chat box, then just you know, we we've sort of bang on for time. So just feel free to just put them in there um, very quickly. There's nothing coming up at the moment. If something comes in, um, then I'll um, I'll let you know. <laughs> oh, I've just seen something coming. Rosie's applying Agile to her HR project work. Oh, brilliant. Um, someone has just put that there's um, a, um, a question. Uh, one question is um, needed in HR. How do you get in the model? Documentation is needed in HR. How do you get that in the model? Uh, so this might be referring to um, the slide where I had... Um, you know, individuals and iterations um, over processes and tools and working processes over comprehensive documentation. So um, hopefully that that's what you're referring to. So obviously there's there's um there's policies, for example, that are mandatory. So they're legislative. Um, we've um, you know think things like you know um, equality and all of those kind of things. So so they are um, mandatory. And that, that's fine. So you can have that documentation. But often long documentation, long policies and, and procedures have evolved to be lots of them and to be long in and of itself because we constantly add things to it. So you've, you've probably, if you've been in HR as long as I have, what can often happen is you have a policy and then somebody will do something at some point. Um, and because they've done something, you then tighten that policy and which means that you end up with lot with a much longer policy to try and um, prevent issues or prevent risks from happening in the future what agile is about is that rather than making that your first your first port of call actually get to the bottom of why something happened so rather than changing a policy actually speak to people understand how something has happened um and then address that root cause rather than just adding in more policies or adding in more um documentation um with the belief that this will protect hr or protect the company it might do but it can often come at a cost and that cost is the administrative burden the energy and effort that goes into it um the um you know the, the ill feeling that can sometimes be caused because other people are having to suffer from having to do a much more long-winded procedure than they did before because somebody did something wrong at some point so that's what i'm alluding to when i say about you know preferring um you know working processes over comprehensive documentation there's always a place for documentation but if it's just there to protect or it's just there to um, to reduce risk, really, you need you need to understand why that is and see if there's another solution there. OK, and um, John has asked how much governance is required at team function and exec level. So that's a brilliant, brilliant um, question. And that really depends on your appetite for Agile and where the business wants to be and whether it's just the HR team or whether it's um, Agile is being implemented um, throughout the whole business. Um, so the way that it can often work at scale is that the business will have a strategy, um, a mission, they'll have OKRs, all of those kind of um, terminology, so objectives and key results. So you'll have that at the top. Then you will have um, different teams that will be um, challenged with whatever the projects or the continuous improvement is. Um, and then there's a rhythm. So the rhythms are that each, each team has somebody that's called a product owner or a product manager. And that is the person that is representing employees, that's representing stakeholders, 
Um, and those stakeholders could be governors or you know execs or, or board or what have you. And they are responsible for making sure that there is that interaction between stakeholders and and the team and that's done by by um sort of testing so they will you know they will run a sprint there will be an outcome of the sprint and then they will um showcase that to um to the stakeholders and get feedback and get an understanding and that will help to steer the team in the next iteration um so in terms of governance um there isn't governance per se um but there are stakeholders that are continually um, communicated with in terms of improvement. So hopefully that's answered that. That's it, Kate, there's no more questions. Just some positive comments about how well the session's gone, so well done. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you so much. And, and thank you for, for sharing your lunchtime with me. I appreciate it. I hope you haven't starved. <laughs> Okay, so I'll just um, close now and just say thanks very much to everybody for, for joining and participating. It sounds like you've all had a really good session, which is fantastic news. Um, the, our next session is in two weeks today. I will send out details on a follow-up email um, this afternoon. So our next session is on the 26th of May at the same time, and it's about limiting beliefs and how they can get in our way. So until then, thank you very much and a massive thanks to Kate for facilitating the session. Thank you. Bye-bye.